Good morning, Pine Ridge. Hope you're all doing really well. Um, this morning, we have a guest speaker coming in, and uh, this is somebody I actually asked to speak a few weeks ago before we knew anything about isolation or, or social distancing or any of that kind of stuff. Um, it's actually my father. Now, he uh, obviously has had to shift gears along with the rest of us, and so I've asked him this morning just to uh, prepare a message that would be appropriate for today. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce my father, Ian Knight. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be part of the uh, congregation at Pine Ridge in these days. And I do want to talk about the times in which we live and how we, as Christ followers, address those times. It's a time of great concern and fear in our world. An out-of-control pandemic setting new highs in infections and deaths every day. An economy in ruins with no good news on the horizon. It's a time of social distancing and lineups wherever stores are even open. And when you get in, there's a lot of empty shops. We're attempting to homeschool at the same time that parents are trying to adapt to work from home protocols. Zoom meetings have become the norm of marketplace conferences now. There are concerns about unsafe and abusive family conditions. And we grieve for seniors who are in health crises at long-term uh, care facilities. And we marvel at the courage of those who serve in such circumstances. It's a time of death and loneliness. And all along, there's the challenge of trying to decipher truth from the torrent of mixed and sometimes conflicting messages. Does God have a word for us in this situation as we search for a path forward through the chaos of our times? Let's pause and pray. Father God, we just pray that you would open your word to us, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher, that you would give us hope and peace and joy as we seek to serve as your people in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's text is drawn from the writings of Luke and John as they describe the events of Easter afternoon and evening. Luke tells us the story of Cleopas and his partner. They were returning home from the national Passover celebration that had been disrupted by the crucifixion of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, they were grieving as they walked along and talked about the events of the past week. They were people living in the despair of the new normal. They wondered what would happen next and how they would need to adapt or if life would ever return to the old familiar pattern. Then Jesus himself approached and joined the conversation and everything changed. As soon as they recognized that it was Jesus, that he really is alive, just as the women had reported, they finally understood that the time for despair is over. The uncertainty is resolved. Purpose and hope have a name, Jesus, and he is alive and well. Luke tells us that they then got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. This is a big deal. It was a two hour walk from Jerusalem and then back again at the end of the day, I think they meant had actually rushed back, even jogged back. And they found the 11 and those with them gathered behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Who was there? 11 scared disciples. Peter, afraid that his denial of Jesus was a rift that might never be mended. John, afraid that he would never again be able to have as close a friend as Jesus had been. Simon the Zealot, afraid that the world he dreamed of would never now come to pass. Nathaniel, afraid that this would turn out to be one more disappointment in his search for meaning. Philip, afraid that he'd let down all the people that he told about Jesus. Andrew, afraid that his search for purpose would be lost. And there were other people there too, Mary Magdalene, afraid she'd been confused, thinking that she had seen Jesus alive again, but she was not getting any buy-in from the others of the group. Perhaps Mary, Jesus' mother, grieving and afraid that all those things that had been said about Jesus were now lost dreams. Perhaps she was confused now about God's purpose in this tragedy. Can you see yourself in this crowd? And when the world's pressing fear into you, when your own future seems less secure than it was a couple of months ago, 
Do you find yourself wondering what's really happening? Fear about what would be next? What does the new normal really look like? Fear about finances and career now that hopes and dreams have been shattered? Fear about being caught unprepared? Fear, fear, fear. Sometimes the fear is so overwhelming it paralyzes us from being even able to think clearly, let alone take any action. We can't move forward, can't move backwards, can't move sideways. We're just afraid. Then Cleopas and his partner entered the room, breathless from their seven mile journey back from Emmaus with the story that they had just talked to the risen Jesus. They said the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how they recognized Jesus as he broke the bread. But in the midst of the fear intensity, the disciples could barely comprehend what was being said, let alone believe it. Sometimes we can't see beyond the frame of our own thinking because moving from fear to belief is just too great a leap to make. The Bible tells us that while they were saying these things, Jesus himself appeared among them and said, peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified, thinking they had seen a ghost. And he, and he said to them, why are you frightened? And why do these doubts arise in your heart? When Jesus enters the room, everything changes. Now take a step back in history. Think of Jesus speaking peace into the troubled room and how that one word stirs up memories in their journeys with Jesus. How he spoke healing peace to the woman who desperately needed to hear it in Mark chapter five. How he spoke calming peace to the wind and the waves and to his fearful disciples during the storm in Mark four. How he spoke peace that evicted demons from a troubled man in Luke four. How he used peace as a metaphor for God's grace in reaching out to people in Luke 10, how he offered peace that overrides the world's fear pressure in John 14, how he describes peace as the dividend for those who accept that he has overcome in John 16. Peace, peace that overflows and imparts God's peace to others. The disciples were glad when they saw that it really was Jesus. And as the memories of the word, what the word peace means as a realization of Jesus' resurrection is breaking into their hearts and souls, Jesus started having some fun with this. He said, look at my hands and feet. It's really me. Touch me and see a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. And when he said them, he showed him his hands and his feet. And while they could still not believe it because of their joy and they were amazed, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? And so they gave him a piece of fish and he took it and ate it in front of them. Jesus' presence in our lives changes everything. His resurrection gives us hope in a time when many fear about death. Jesus' resurrection appearances confirm the validity of every promise he has made. His life is a demonstration that he is greater than health concerns. He is greater than financial concerns. He's greater than relational distance. His life is a confirmation that we are not bound to time or space or physics. We are joined to him whose authority transcends those limitations. Jesus' presence establishes his authority in the room. And it's not an authority to govern or rule. It's an authority to proclaim and offer peace. Not just an absence of conflict, but God's peace being offered unconditionally. Jesus said, my peace is not like the world's peace. And he gives and imparts that peace to us. We are commissioned, we are sent to be agents of God's peace. Now, the Holy Spirit is a super agent of peace and he indwells us. And we're to wear peace like a uniform that invades everywhere we go with God's peace. It's peace with a purpose. Jesus did not give us the peace to hoard, but to share. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And after this, he breathed on them, 
and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the breath of God, like a contagion that breathes God's breath on others, releasing God's power on others, affirming God's gifting and authority to others. We never again read of the disciples living in fear. We read about them traveling all over the Roman Empire with the good news about peace with God available through a relationship with Jesus. We read about them being persecuted, but responding in such a way that thousands of people chose to exit their own fear and accept Jesus' offer of peace. We read about miracles of healing, provision, protection, relational reconciliation, all in the name of Jesus. So much so that within a few years, they were being described as people who had turned their world upside down, all in the name of Jesus. Do you feel like fear is closing in on you like a vice? Are the pressures of these times overwhelming you? Do you feel like your life has more questions and answers in these days? Is it even possible that you're feeling the paralysis of not knowing what to do next? Psalm 34 tells us that the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 145, the Lord is near all who cry out to him, all who cry out to him sincerely. He satisfies the desire of his loyal followers. He hears their cry for help and he delivers them. If you feel like you're locked in within a cage of social distancing, if fear is bombarding you from every side, then this is a word for you from Jesus himself. He said, I am with you right up to the end of time. Jesus has appeared and he still gives hope and faith, life, healing, provision, protection, and he never abandons us. So let us be a people who run to help, not run from danger. Let us be a people who carry the life of Jesus. Let us go and declare and bring peace to people we know who are troubled and drowning in fear. Let us be Jesus' agents of reconciliation, helping people find their way back to God. Let's pray again. Father God, thank you for your word. Would you make your word come alive in our hearts today? Would you lead us from the places that we've been compressed into and lead us to be people who are outward thinking, outward focused, adaptive, resilient to your purposes, and able to serve others so that they can know the peace of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. So for a benediction. And this is what the Lord says, the one who created you and formed you. Don't be afraid, for I will protect you. I call you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'm with you. When you pass through the streams, they will not overwhelm you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not harm you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Deliverer. You are precious and special in my sight, and I love you. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Amen.